Grab your Bible, go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 3. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 3. And uh, i read a very familiar story to you, and then we're going to read into chapter number 4. Matthew chapter 3, verse number 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is, pro it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up out of the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved with whom I'm well pleased. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It's written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. Away with you, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and, him only, and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly the angels came and they waited on him. Amen and amen. One of the things, I think, one of the most difficult things to do in the Christian life, at least my own life, and maybe I'm just dysfunctional in this way. I don't know. I think one of the most dis challenging things to do in the Christian life is to be able to properly discern between all of the voices that come to you, all of the voices that you hear. Paul even references this in Corinthians when he says there are many voices in the world. One of the most challenging things to do is to be able to discern between those voices, to be able to discern between the voice of God and sometimes even the voice of our own conscience. Those are not always the same thing. When I talk about the voice of your conscience, I'm talking about that voice of authority that's been shaped in you, and it's shaped in us in all sorts of ways. It's shaped in us in the way we're raised. It's shaped in us through the experiences that we have. It's shaped in us through the teaching that we've submitted to and sat under for years. That voice of conscience can become authoritative to the point that if you violate that voice, you think you're violating God. Right? There are entire denominations today that believe if you use any other Bible than the King James Version of the Bible, then you're going to hell. And to that I say, amen. <laughs> right? No, how do we get there? How do you get to the place where something that uh, unimportant becomes a, a, a issue of massive consequence? It's not that you're violating the voice of God. You're violating the voice of your own conscience. You with me? There are entire denominations that don't believe that women can be in leadership. We were sitting in a staff meeting the other day, and Miss Karen was casting all of this vision and putting all this stuff on the board. And I looked at Dr. Alexander, and I said, if she's not a visionary apostolic leader, there's not one. Right? There's entire denominations that believe women can't do that based upon certain biblical readings. And they believe that if they violate that, they would be violating God. It's hard to discern all of the voices sometimes. Are you with me? This is how years ago, when, especially when I grew up, you could, we, we got to the place where we couldn't do things like wear blue jeans or watch football. And thank God we got delivered. Right? But how do we get there? Teaching that we sit under, experiences that we have, shape a voice of authority in us that can pretend to be God to us. And if discerning between, are y'all with me so far? I promise you I'm going somewhere. I'm not going to keep you long either because Betsy gets mad at me if I preach long. 
she's left. Buckle up. <laughs> she left because she knew I was preaching, and she didn't want to have to deal with it probably. Even more difficult than discerning between the voice of God and the voice of our own conscience can be discerning between the voice of God and the voice of Satan. Now, when I grew up, I was always told we would, take, we would take these classes and they would teach us on how to be led by the Spirit of God and how to hear the voice of God. And preachers would always tell us, it, being able to separate the voice of God from the voice of Satan, that's simple. It's as easy as separating light from darkness. And that's not true. And they would teach us that God's voice is light and Satan's voice is darkness. But that's not true. God's voice is light, but Satan's voice is not darkness. God's voice is light. Satan's voice is false light. This is what Paul means when he says when Satan comes, he transforms himself into an angel of light. Y'all weirded out yet? It gets way weirder than this. Lindsay asked me tonight, what are you going to preach on? I said, I should preach on the spiritual universe of the New Testament and principalities and powers and thrones and dominions, but then nobody would ever want to hear me preach again. (laughs) Satan comes as an angel. When Satan comes to us, he does not come as a monster. He comes as an angel. This is what Paul means in Galatians chapter 1 when he says, if I or even an angel... Preach another gospel to you than the one that you've received. Let that angel be accursed. Let that angel be accursed. You see this in the life of Peter. Peter has already identified and named Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then Peter, later on in his journey, tries to keep Jesus from going to Jerusalem to be crucified. And Jesus famously says what? Get behind me, Satan. Now, the demonic is pure darkness, but the satanic is false light. I promise you I'm going somewhere. Just hang in here. All right? The demonic is total darkness. Everybody knows what the demonic is, right? (laughs) When Alabama loses the football games, there's a devil loose. When you think demonic, think of the maniac of Gadara, right? Legion, cutting himself with stones. That's demonic. Okay. But Satan doesn't come as a monster. He comes as an angel. This is how wheat and tares can grow up together, and nobody can discern between the two. Okay? Now... If the demonic is total darkness and the satanic is false light, what does that mean? The demonic is evil. We know that, right? But the satanic is when we do evil in the name of a greater good. I'll give you a great example. Uh, Y'all are so confused. Uh, This is the wrong sermon. I can already tell this is the wrong sermon. But we're too deep into it now. One of my favorite movies in the world is A Few Good Men. Watch it on one of your filter systems, if you watch it. Y'all know what a few good men is, right? No, y'all are all homeschooled. <laughs> I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Oh, never mind. The whole idea of the movie, here's a bunch of spoiler alerts. The whole idea of the movie is there's a Marine Corps base there's a weak Marine, a powerless Marine. You said that's right. Hoorah, I hear you. There's a powerless Marine. He's, he has underperforming. He's not doing very well. And so they haze him. That's right. They haze him so violently that it kills him. That's right. All right. And at the end of the movie, they're being tried in front of a courtroom. And the general says, I know his death is tragic, but even in us killing him, we saved lives. We did evil in the name of a greater good. Right? I promise you I'm going somewhere. Hang in here. That's the satanic. Being wounded is one thing. Wounding another to prevent being wounded is satanic. 
All right? Being victimized is demonic. Retaliating and victimizing another so I'm never victimized again is satanic. All right? You have to be able to discern between these voices. Now, we get to Jesus' story, and Satan comes to him, and we've always heard this where it says, if you be the son of God, without getting too deep into it, there's, there's another way to translate that text. And it's not, if you be the son of God. The voice of the father has already pronounced that Jesus is the son. Everybody knows that Jesus is the son. John said, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. The voice of the Father comes and says, you are my son. This is established. Jesus is the son. Satan comes to him, and he's not saying, one translation says, if you be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Another translation says, since you are the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. In other words, I'm not questioning whether or not you are a son. I'm questioning how you're going to use the sonship that you've been given. You've been given a position of privilege and a position of power. Now are you going to use that position to consume it upon your own lusts? Since you're the son, turn these stones into bread. Since you're a son, use your sonship to meet your own needs in your own way. I grew up with this kind of teaching. I grew up my entire life with this kind of teaching. They would teach us that you're entitled to health and wealth and prosperity, and you're never supposed to have a bad day in your life, and you're never supposed to have a struggle, and you're never supposed to suffer, and you're never supposed to have a problem, and if you do, you just don't have enough faith in God. And I believe God wants you blessed. I believe God wants you healthy and wealthy and prosperous and all the stuff. And I used to teach that God didn't want you to suffer until I lived a little bit of life. And they would use this kind of language. I don't have to go through things because I'm a son. I'm using my position to leverage the life that I want. And that is not what sonship is for. That's not what sonship is for. Since you're the son, command these stones to be made bread. Since you're the son, throw yourself down off of the temple. The angels will catch you. Since you're a son, start believing that you are protected from the vulnerability that comes with being human. Sometimes when people are suffering, they feel so condemned because they believe sons and daughters of God don't go through this. They most certainly do. Our faith celebrates not heroes. We celebrate martyrs. We celebrate whose, people's, whose lives were cut short. We celebrate people that were murdered in their early 20s who could have lived 60, 70 more years had they not obeyed God. Our, our faith is not a faith full of heroes. You with me? Throw yourself down off the temple. I remember I grew up in the Word of Faith movement. I had a guy tell me this one time. He said, if Christians are suffering, it's because they're stupid. Don't that make you feel... Ah, Man, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Nothing like a word spoken. Proverbs says a word spoken in season. How good is it? <laughs> it's like an apple set in a fitting of silver. Because he believed that if you knew enough Bible, you could take the Bible and use it like a gun to God's head and get the life that you wanted. Right? Now, I, I, want, you to, I want to make clear. I believe God wants you blessed. I believe God wants you blessed. We need you to be blessed. Have you heard all the vision? <laughs> Somebody's got to pay for that. <laughs> right? God wants you blessed. He wants me blessed. He wants, he wants us healed. He wants us whole. Okay? But not because we're sons and we leverage it to our benefit. Even Jesus said it rains on the just and the unjust. I'll feed the sparrows even if they don't sow. Sonship is not about leveraging power to get your way and to get your life. And then Satan tempts him again with something that's profoundly, profoundly deeper. He says, listen, if you won't turn these stones to bread. Since you're the son, I will give you all of these kingdoms. I will give you all the power in the world. If you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus rejects power. 
because sonship is never about wielding power. Sonship is not meant to be useful in that way. I was listening to somebody, a political figure speak, and whoever your political figure is, I could not care less. It wasn't whoever yours is. I promise. All right. So simmer down. But I was listening to this political figure speak, and they were getting, they were giving this speech, and they were, you know, you know, stirring it up. Phrases like, they're taking over, whoever that they are. They're taking, and they said this. They said, we know that Jesus says, turn the other cheek. But so far, that's gotten us nowhere. Now, what are they saying when they say that? They're saying a bunch of things. But the first thing they're saying is, we will follow Jesus to a point. We'll follow Jesus to a point. That's the first thing they're saying. The second thing they're saying is, that point ends when Jesus stops being useful for what I want. But Christianity is not useful. Jesus isn't useful. Sonship isn't useful. It is so quiet in here. That's why when Jesus is tempted by Satan with power, Jesus rejects it. No, I don't deserve to be in power and run things around here because I'm a son. You know, the earliest Pentecostals, we, we, we talk about, Miss Karen shared this the other day about her upbringing and all of the good from the previous Pentecostal world that we need to embrace and keep. The earliest Pentecostals, some of their, some of their lifestyle, the reason they abstained from things like football games and br- brushing your teeth, I don't know. I mean, all the stuff that they abstained from, Right? The reason we did that is because they had an identity. And their identity was this. We are from another world. We are otherworldly. We're not a part of this system. We're not a part of this world. It had a pure motive behind it. It might have been, it might have been misconstrued and misguided in some of those, but it had a pure motive behind it. We are not of this world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. Now, it had its extremes and its excesses, but we rebuked that and we overcorrected. And this is how we overcorrected. We went from not being of this world, not being of this system, we overcorrected to now we are an invading force called to run everything. There's elaborate teachings on how Christians should be set up in all of these spheres of authority and advance the kingdom through power, specifically political power. And this is the very thing that Jesus is tempted with and the very thing that Jesus rejects. We're not called to be so disconnected from the world that we are of no use, nor are we some invading, advancing army going to break people into serving Jesus. We are sons and daughters that are called to serve our neighbor, the life of God that he has given us. Are you with me? Since you're the son, take power. After all, you can use this power to advance the kingdom. This is precisely what Saul was doing before he becomes Paul. He wasn't just some misguided, murderous lunatic. He was doing it in the name of God. But when he sees Jesus on the Damascus road, Paul, Saul is is slaughtering Christians. Everybody knows the story. He is slaughtering Christians. He is drinking deeply from the stories that Israel told. Stories about Phineas, who there was a man and a woman having sex at the entrance of the temple. Phineas goes in and murders them in the name of God because they're violating God's temple. These are the stories that Saul's reading. But when he sees Jesus 
on the Damascus Road, it forever redefines how he reads these stories. Right? Saul no longer saw himself as Joshua invading the land of the Christians. Now Paul sees Jesus as his conquering king coming in to overthrow the enemies of his own heart. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is what sonship means. It means we're called to serve our neighbor. And it might not be anything more epic than that. Right? We are so bent on heroic Christianity that we miss just being Christian. Right? Now, what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to hear all this and think, oh, that's, you know, that's good. We need to. We need to outreach more. Maybe we do. I don't know. That's not what I'm saying. I don't want you to leave and say, you know what? I'm going to be more intentional about random acts of kindness. I'm going to start paying for the person behind me in the drive-thru. Knock yourself out, especially if I'm behind you. <laughs> it's possible. These parents with families know it's possible to spend $75 at Chick-fil-A. Right. So pay for everybody. I don't care. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about completely reorienting how we see ourselves as sons in a way that reorients how we see those that are not. You have power. God didn't send me here for power. I did not come to be ministered to. I came to minister and give my life a ransom for many. Watch what, watch what Jesus does when he has pronounced a son. He goes down into the Jordan in his baptism. All of these pictures are profound. You know, you know the story of, of Israel's history with the Jordan? Joshua leads the children of Israel out of the wilderness, through the Jordan, into the promised land. Now Jesus is in the promised land, going back through the Jordan to go back into the wilderness to redeem Israel's failures in the wilderness. But when God sent the Israelites through the Jordan, the Jordan split for them. Remember that story? The priests go first, and as soon as their ankles touch, the water split. But when Jesus goes into the water, the water doesn't split. He has to go down into it. Who else went down into water? The Egyptians. Because Jesus was not just doing this for Israel. He was also doing this for Egypt. He was not doing what he was doing just for God's friends. He was doing what he was doing for God's enemies too. It is easy to love the people in this room. What really proves our Christianity is how we treat the people that are the most unlike us. That's what sonship is. I'm going to go down into the waters of your suffering. This might be, this is probably the most controversial thing I say all night right here. You ready? And like I said, you are free to ignore me. I ignore myself half the time. Our relationship with God is most Christian when we are more concerned about others' relationship with God than we are our own. Paul says this in Romans. I would rather be cut off from Christ if it means my brother's Israel could be saved. Think of that. Because what it means to be a son is that I'm giving my life for the sake of the world. Miss Karen alluded to this earlier tonight. The reason worship, as we worship God, we are caught up and she begins to prophesy about an addiction center because God's chief concern is others. And the more we are drawn up into him, the more we partake of his divine nature and he immediately turns our attention somewhere else. God doesn't even want the attention to stay on him. This is what the Calvinists get so wrong. They claim that God's chief end is his own glory. And God is not concerned with his own glory. God is humble. God doesn't have ego. 
Are y'all okay? I'm almost done. I would rather be cut off from Christ. As we are drawn up in him, he turns our attention elsewhere. He doesn't even want our attention to stay on him. The more we go pursue him, the more he turns our eyes outward. The more we go after him, the more he turns our eyes outward. There was a great, a great author. I won't tell you his name. I will. His name is St. Bernard. The saint word trips everybody up. He said, every Christian is in need of two conversions. Their first conversion is they are converted from the world to God. And as they sit at his feet, they go through another conversion where now they are converted from God back to the world. Again, this is not, this is beyond you paying for somebody's pizza hut. And do that, especially if it's mine. I'll t- tell you this story. There's, I was at a class in Florida, and the professor was teaching along some of these lines. And he was talking about this kind of, this kind of life. Lived, living, being poured out for the sake of others. And he was teaching this, and the class ends, and we leave. And we come back the next day for class. But after we left that first day, a young lady walks in, and she tells a story. As he was teaching about this. She walks in, and she tells a story. She says, after class the other day, or yesterday, me and my friend went to Walmart. We had to pick up some things. And we went and got our stuff, went to the checkout line. And when we went to the checkout line, the guy in front of us, as soon as we turned the corner and he was there, we were were hit in the face by the, the smell of alcohol. It was just overwhelming. He was just highly, highly, highly intoxicated. And she said, I don't know what happened. She said, but as soon as we turned and as soon as that hit us, she said, I was immediately, by the Spirit, I was immediately overcome with his shame. She said, I don't know what to do. I collapsed in the floor and I started crying. I, I didn't know what to do. Because I was overcome with his brokenness. That is the intercessory act of the Christian. I was overcome by his shame. This is why Jesus is touched by our infirmities. You with me? There's a great, great author by the name of Flannery O'Connor. She writes short stories. And she's got a beautiful, beautiful short story called The Temple of the Holy Ghost. It's the title of this story, The Temple of the Holy Ghost. And in this story... She's a young Catholic girl. In the story, there's a young Catholic girl. And there's a circus coming to town. The carnival. Circus, fair, whatever you want to call it. And in this circus, they have a person there that is intersexed. Meaning they have both male and female body parts. And the whole town is paying money to come out to see this individual. It's the freak. It's the sideshow freak. It's the freak of the circus. We're coming to see this freak and laugh and mock and make fun. And the whole town is talking about it. We're going to pretend that's approval. (laughs) This is my beloved son. Hear him. And so she goes to her Sunday morning service, and they're taking communion. And as they take communion, the priest holds up the bread. And the little girl, she looks at the bread. And when she looks at the bread, she is by the Spirit. We would call it an encounter. She has an encounter. And she's immediately taken to the dressing room of this intersexed person the freak and she hears this person saying in the privacy of their room but I thought God made me this way but I thought God made me this way 
And the whole point of her story was, as we behold him, he immediately turns our attention to the freaks. He immediately turns our attention to the freaks. This was part of the difference in the early Pentecostal world when they started teaching that tongues is the evidence that you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. And William Seymour stood up and said, there's no way that's true. William Seymour from Azusa said, tongues is not the sign of the Holy Ghost. Love is the sign of the Holy Ghost. Because all of these white people are speaking in tongues and they won't even let me sit in the same room with them. There's no way God's at work in their life when they can't turn their attention toward me. That is what the Father calls sonship. When you die the death in the water of others, not power, not using it as leverage, preach way too long not using it to meet your own needs sons and daughters being sons and daughters doesn't mean i get what i want when i want it it means i'm here in the earth to pour my life out for everybody else amen